that's that's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Heather Alore from Yale University, and she will present uh, the topic calculating additive contributions of dimension chronic conditions to hospitalization, skilled nursing facility admission, and mortality. Why race matters. So Heather, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I've had a wonderful time uh, these past two days, and I hope that this talk is actually going to uh, summarize quite a bit of what we have heard. And why is it not paging down? Um, so here are my acknowledgments. I uh, received funding uh, from the uh, NIH, especially NIA. And I um, am part of both the Pepper Center and uh, ADRC that we have at Yale, as well as the uh, NIA Embedded Pragmatic Alzheimer's Disease and AD Related Dementias Clinical Trials Collaboratory. And so that's focused on non pharmacologic interventions for persons living with dementia and their care partners. So I'd um, like to thank the organizers. It's been put together very well. And I hope that this uh, will be enjoyable. I have no commercial interests or conflicts. So first we're gonna start with a viewpoint from the Lancet. Excuse me, Heather, do we supposed to hear some audio with this video? Because we just uh, can, or it's... Are you, oh, okay, so you're not hearing anything. No, no, and I, I also get some okay. messages in our chat. Okay. Um, you all have the screen, the, the slide set there, correct? Yes, I can see the video. No, no, no. I sent the slides for this talk. Uh, yes. Um, I'll, so I'll... I think you should um, use the slides and that way we can, you'll be, you should be able to hear through your system. Uh, I sent an updated center, uh, set around lunchtime. Uh, could you remind us the file name of the file? Uh, the file name is Allure Duke NIA 0307 PowerPoint. Uh, it will be up in 
30 seconds as soon as I find okay. it. Um, so if you could start that, uh, that slide um, that has the embedded video, and then I'll just say next, whatever I need the next slide. How's that? Sure, we can probably set that up. So sorry. You should just be able to click on it and have it go. We tested this earlier. Dr. Alor, if you send the link into chat, it would be easier for us to uh, run the video separately and then have you continue the presentation. It, it will run now. Hold on. <clears throat> When I go to the doctor, I can easily say whether I have chest pain or weight loss, but I always struggle with one question, my race. I have both Italian and Mapuche indigenous heritage. So how should I answer? Uh, yes, there was a problem in the screen sharing. Everyone should be able to see. When I go to the doctor, I can easily say whether I have chest pain or weight loss, but I always struggle with one question, my race. I have both Italian and Mapuche indigenous heritage. So how should I answer? I apologize, one second. This is creating. When I go to the doctor, I can easily say whether I have chest pain or weight loss, but I always struggle with one question, my race. I have both Italian and Mapuche indigenous heritage. So how should I answer? Though human populations are incredibly diverse, there's actually very little overall genetic difference among us. These differences are distributed geographically and affected by environmental interactions and genetic mixing. Variations in physical differences, like skin color, occur gradually and do not organize neatly into groups. It wasn't until European colonization that false ideas about biological racial types emerged. Groups were divided arbitrarily, and because of this, race has shifted over time. But in the doctor's office, I have to check a box that can change my medical care. If I check Native American, I'm considered at risk for diabetes. Is that why I was screened even though I was perfectly healthy? And what if I just check white? What then? Race-based medicine hurts everyone, not just Jess. Clinicians should not rely on false notions of racial biology to recommend treatments, nor should we ignore the reality of race. Instead, we need race-conscious medicine that emphasizes racism as a determinant of health. First, we have to stop using race-based clinical practices. Jess should be screened for diabetes based on her symptoms, family history, and diet, not whether she identifies as indigenous. Second, we must teach clinicians that health inequities result from structural racism, not intrinsic racial difference. Indigenous people likely have higher rates of diabetes due to colonization, poverty, and subsidies that make processed foods cheap, not because of an indigenous gene. Third, we need clinical societies to pass resolutions that denounce race-based medicine. Finally, we need to ensure that research involving race carefully accounts for the effects of racism, rather than using race as a proxy for genetics. As anti-racist uprisings in COVID-19 have spotlighted how structural racism determines who lives and who dies, the medical field must dismantle its own racist practices. Um, should someone help me advance the slides or do you want me to go back to my slide set? Okay, great. Um, so if I can just say next and you um, move them, that'd be great. So I'm just going to give a real quick overview. I think it's uh, a really wonderful workshop. We've heard biologically driven presentations. We've heard about genes, biomarkers, biologic pathways. Um, cardiovascular. So we've, we've had a biologic uh, perspective. We've heard about different data sources. There are pros, there are cons. 
their interconnectivity. I think one of the things with data sources that uh, we're really missing, and I would hope that we could have uh, better resources in the future are for indigenous people. Uh, I find that largely missing. And it was only uh, Dr. Martin from the NIA who brought up sexual minorities. Um, I think that is a, a group that experiences quite a few health disparities and their partnerships, especially in later life aren't uh, recognized. So I hope in the future we can hear more about that. We've heard about persons living with dementia. I prefer that term because people are living with dementia. The whole GEMS assessment talk was really uh, very person centric and uh, recognize uh, the person is living with this. Uh, we've heard about different settings, home-based settings, uh, community settings, um, home-based care, nursing home care. Uh, we've heard uh, how we should be more cognizant in the need for enrollment um, across different studies in different settings. Uh, we've had wonderful talks on some analytic methodologies. Uh, some of them are really new to uh, understanding uh, health uh, disparities and also um, newer to areas of uh, ADRD. Uh, we've heard about gl global communities, variations um, uh, uh, within self-reported race. Uh, Dr. Bennett's uh, uh, graphics of showing how with self-reported race, when you ask people in different parts of the world, um, they're actually often um, genetically quite mixed. And I think as Americans, we may also recognize that we are not uh, any one of us all that homogeneous. Um, we've heard about care partners. We've touched on them for persons living with dementia. Um, certainly care partners are a, a critical role in uh, receiving care and quality of life. And that's probably an area that along with health disparities, uh, we've heard some of the importance of that in the future. Uh, that would be an area to grow because they uh, are supporting that access to care, nutrition, uh, quality of life metrics. Uh, and a variety of things, as well as they may be aging themselves or the sandwich generation and facing stressors. And uh, Dr. Gashin pointed out um, uh, problems with stress. None of us like it. Um, one of the things we, we know um, vary quite a bit is what is the definition of uh, one's cognitive status. It varies as many different instruments. I'm part of an ADRC. We have this huge battery of instruments that um, participants receive. Uh, different studies may just use like uh, HRS uses ticks. There's a variety of different tools that are used. We've um, heard challenges, uh, pros and, and cons of harmonization, but um, you, classification by different instruments may not be the same. So that's something we need to be aware of, as well as the challenge of uh, defining the co-occurring conditions. Is it just a single Medicare claim? What are the different ways that we really uh, can determine that? And they differ by data sources. And then we uh, touched on priorities and working within communities and uh, assessing the, the future needs of the field. Uh, next, please. So let's think about big data for a second. Like, let's take our planet. We have only one planet, and we should love our planet. So this is a, a graphic from the Lancet Neurology from 2019, and it's looking at some age standardized prevalences for Alzheimer's and, and other dementias. Now, you can look at this and see these, these colors, and they vary. But I would say one of the challenges in putting this together, and this a very large uh, uh, a set of authors worked very hard to do this, is there are stigmas uh, with uh, getting a dementia diagnosis. There are cultural differences that we heard about that uh, some uh, 
individuals may feel that this is a normal part of aging. They're not going to look for a diagnosis. So if we just even look at this, do we really know, and I'm not saying anything's wrong with this article, but there's a lot of variability. These come from a number of sources, but we can see this is really something that is global. It's not uh, focused in any single group. Next, please. Now, uh, Lancet, uh, their global health um, uh, forum in 2019 also had a really wonderful little article on the population attributable fractions for risk factors for dementia. And they looked at low and middle income countries. And although they used a cross-sectional survey uh, uh, data, and we did hear um, in some kind of questions for Dr. Martin about you know, longitudinal and cross-sectional, there's challenges of each. But this graphic so encompasses what we've been talking about for the two days that I hope you all go look at this article. We see they break it into early life, midlife, and later life um, uh, concerns. In early life, low education uh, across these different countries. And I, I do include at the bottom um, from uh, uh, a recent uh, Frontiers in uh, Neurology uh, uh, a sentence from um, the, where they did this in South Africa. And we also see low education, but 12% there. This is the percent reduction in the cases of dementia if the risk factor is completely eliminated. So we know that that would be uh, highly unlikely to totally remove a risk factor, but we can see that early life education, midlife we've been hearing about, hypertension, obesity, but I'd like to draw our attention to hearing loss. And maybe in the future, we can hear more um, from presenters on how hearing may be an important factor. Uh, in later life, depression. We've been hearing about depression and diabetes, but you can see their contributions tend to be smaller than early and midlife. But we also have social isolation, something we've all been facing uh, during the period of COVID, physical act, uh, inactivity, smoking. So these are all important things that, uh, that are building to, into health as well as dementia. Next, please. So I'd like to just share with you a, a informatics tool that our uh, Yale ADRC uh, has um, been creating and uh, it is accessible and will be, uh, um, there's one publication listed here. It was put together by Dr. Caroline Zeiss, who's the co-leader of our ADRC's Neuropath Corps with uh, some members of our informatics group as well as um, two other universities, University of Illinois and Einstein. And this is um, a curated uh, database. It's the, the whole corpus of PubMed. It looks at every abstract that has Alzheimer's disease in it. Uh, currently it has over 286,000 papers in it. And this is just one image kind of showing um, the number of animal species uh, uh, that are used to test different interventions. Um, the approved drugs are in red, the not approved are in uh, blue, and it's showing basically this relationship with functional outcomes. Next, please. So this is an interactive relational database and it rapidly aggregates and organizes translationally relevant um, abstracts from PubMed. So there's a number of different fields. You can download uh, this whole thing. You can uh, um, use it in a variety of different ways, depending on what your um, comfort is with uh, informatics tools. Next, please. So uh, this is just briefly showing the number of uh, uh, PubMed IDs for different species across uh, the, the x-axis organizes uh, what has been studied, whether it's physiology, TBI, diabetes, diet, 
uh, pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic, immunotherapy, stem shells. So it's one way to look at the data. And next, please. Another way is you could say, well, how would I, um, I want to investigate some potential therapeutic targets. Uh, earlier in, uh, in the, the past uh, workshop today, uh, we heard about sleep. We've uh, just seen that physical inactivity may be related. So what if I wanted to look at that and see, are there any common gene mentions? And so I can find that. This is just one example where I pull out uh, double quartin. Next, please. And then I can say, okay, what, what animal models are used? What are the outcomes they're measuring? Next, please. And then what are these other categories I can find out about? Gene co-mentions, fluid biomarkers, pathology, neuroanatomy. Um, next, please. And then we, we heard about uh, earlier about ARIA. So you can do a whole search on that, looking at, uh, I want to look at interventions. I want to see their pathology. What species were they? studied in. I want you to pull out all, give me the uh, PMIDs of all of these, and then I want to see that on outcome measures. So it's just a handy informatics tool. Uh, our ADRC uh, is focused on biomarkers, and so we develop this as a tool that researchers can use to try and integrate across the corpus uh, of the pub, uh, publicly available data and uh, in uh, publications. Next, please. So now let me tell you a little about some of the work uh, I've been doing with Chi Chen, who's uh, at our School of Public Health. And here we see, uh, uh, this is a, uh, some results of an article under review. And I'm gonna focus again on that early life uh, circumstances, so less favorable early life set circumstances are associated with clinically meaningful and statistically significant racial gaps in cognition. So uh, we've been hearing about early life. Um, and so we've heard I, in this, we're using um, HRS. Uh, we've already heard a lot about the HRS. Um, there, just to remind us all, their uh, cognitive score is based on the telephone interview for cognitive status or TICS. And the wonderful thing about this is we're using a method that uh, Igor uh, shared with us yesterday, the Blinda Oaxaca decomposition to evaluate the disparities in these cognitive outcomes between the white and black participants attributable to these early life circumstances. Next, please. Next, please. Ah, great. So this is just a, a little flow diagram. Um, it, that will, I hope, I hope these slides can be shared because um, uh, it'll be a lot easier for people to, to see them if they can be. And it breaks down where we're getting those early life circumstances, All right? So the HRS, we have our core sample, and then we have what we call the trauma sample. And I think this uh, connects to what Dr. Yation was uh, sharing with us. And in that, we're using the enhanced face-to-face -face and the life history mail survey to look at uh, factors we're calling trauma factors, which would be physical abuse, uh, parents using drugs or alcohol, trouble with police, repeated, uh, repeating school, other trauma factors are orphanage, foster care, uh, death of a parent, uh, divorce, separation, and um, then there's family relationship factors. And then our bottom sample is the um, PGS, and that is really using uh, the polygenic scores available in a subset of the health and retirement study. So we're trying to build in um, more information in that uh, sample. And so we can try as best as we can with this uh, originally nationally representative sample. Next, please. So this slide shows the relative and absolute contributions of the overall early life circumstances to racial gaps 
in cognition between the white and the black participants. So these are differences. So the blue lines are the first observation in HRS. So they're approximately 50 years old. And the red lines show their latest. So if, uh, if they were only followed for two years, uh, HRS samples every two years, it would be they'd be 52. If they've been followed for 20 years, they would be 20 years older. And so the, the top row are the relative differences. That's the percentage of the gap explained. Those are our three samples, the overall, those that include the trauma, and then the polygenic risk scores that have the trauma information as well as the genetic information. And then the bottom row are uh, absolute measures of that. So based on a cutoff for cognitive impairment on the right side of the screen. Next, please. So then let's pull out actually what were the factors, those individual factors that we're uh, finding important. And we see uh, whether you're looking at a cognitive score or cognitive impairment, that education in years is very important, as well as parental education. So that gets at some of the structural issues. Your, your parents uh, also had poor education. Um, the ownership of books um, can also be important in cognitive scores. Uh, uh, whether the family received financial help, and also uh, for cognitive impairment, whether the mother was working before the person was 18 years old. Next, please. So now we can see, okay, there, there were error bars, so there's clearly uh, heterogeneity. So um, we have worked on some methods to try and uh, help people work with the uh, heterogeneity. So we work on something we call the typical and the person-specific uh, concurrent risk. So I'm going to try and move a little swiftly since we had a little challenge with the video. Uh, but basically, we know multimorbidity is a challenge. People with uh, living with dementia often have uh, multimorbidity. So now we're going to look at 15 chronic conditions on three interrelated outcomes, hospitalization, skilled nursing facility, and mortality. Think about it. How do you tend to get to the skilled nursing facility? It's often a discharge from the hospital. We've heard about how uh, uh, Medicare fee-for-service uh, covers and how many days, the 20 days and the 100 days. So we, can, we know these are correlated outcomes. If you go to the hospital, you're more likely to die. People in uh, skilled nursing facilities also have a higher risk of death. So we're going to be using the National Health and Aging Trend Study to do this. So that so these are concurrent um, risks. So you can go to the hospital multiple times uh, over our five years we're going to look at. You can go to the uh, nursing home several times, but you can only die once. So uh, hospitalization and skilled nursing facilities are not censoring, though mortality is. So that typical concurrent risk of each outcome is the probability at the cohort level. So it's more of an absolute value than a relative one. It's a probability of an average longitudinal effect. And then the person specific reflects the probability of the outcome at the person level. Next, please. So we do this with some methods. In the interest of time, and we, we have an article here that goes through it. In the interest of time, we're going to the next slide. So the personalized is, is that person uh, level probability that's going to be above or below uh, the typical. Next, please. So here we're just looking, one of the parts that we, we do this, we, we estimate this jointly. So uh, dementia is circled there in blue. So we can see that it's uh, increasing the risk of hospitalization, skilled nursing facility, and mortality, just for several different things. Next, please. 
Now, let me show you what I'm trying to get at with this heterogeneity. So in this image, the, um, the top two, A and B, are, remember, we're, we're jointly estimating these. So the typical con con current risk is that <coughs> that probability over the follow-up period that on the left, a person without dementia would um, have a hospitalization. And on the right side, it would be for the person with dementia. Now, the special thing about this is those, those odd dotted lines. Now, these are um, for individuals, nine women with and nine women without dementia that all have hypertension, diabetes, depression. So they, we had them identical on their diseases. We know these are ones associated with dementia. And you can see the bottom row is that probability of going to a skilled nursing facility. And yet those dots uh, with the, the lines that go up and down, there we're ranking the random effects of the people. So we can see that the, for panels A and C, the woman on the most right, her probability, her person specific or personalized probability is around 0.1 while uh, her cohort member uh, that would be the same panel, but all the way to the right is around nearly 0.5. So we have quite a bit of variation and this technique allows you to um, be able to model that. Next, please. So how can you get this code? Just go to the Pepper Center's National Coordinating Center, go to um, this, uh, uh, page is at Wake Forest, so just down the road from you. We put this together. Uh, Yale and Wake Forest and Duke uh, did this as a joint project. It's now with all the, the Pepper Centers. In there, you can get the code for this. This is called CR Coder. Next, please. We have a paper how to do it. You can get it at the website. Next, please as well as um, it has features that we're not using in this article. So you can use propensity scoring, covariate uh, adjustment, or them both if you're trying to move towards uh, some causal modeling. So you can be doing these joint models for repeated outcomes. And so I just want to tell you the code's right there to do it. Next, please. So now what if we wanna have an absolute contribution. So you can see I've really got this thing about absolute because uh, these relative, it's always so hard for me, even as a biostatistician, what really is something that's relative. So we heard uh, Dr. Canones earlier share with us about multimorbidity being a problem. We've heard about uh, the challenges of minoritized populations. We've heard about prevalences and patterns of chronic uh, conditions can vary by race and age of onset. And so in, uh, now I'm going to show you some absolute contributions of, uh, of another approach for an average attributable fraction. Next, please. So we call this the longitudinal extension of the average attributable fraction, uh, and I'm going to be showing this um, uh, to you for 11 of those <coughs> chronic conditions we saw just a few minutes ago for the same outcomes you saw just a few minutes ago. So another way to uh, view this. Now, yesterday in the afternoon, there was a question about, should we ever sep um, uh, separately model uh, different racial or ethnic groups? And today I'm going to make an, uh, a suggestion that in some cases it may be appropriate. And in this case, I will argue it may be appropriate because elements that go into calculating this include the uh, prevalence of the condition upon uh, entry to the cohort, the incidence of the chronic uh, conditions, as well as the uh, association estimates. When those are varying uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively, between subgroups, 
then I would suggest there may be real benefits to modeling them separately. Next, please. So here it is, the leaf, uh, wonderful things about it. Uh, you can go look at these later. Let me boil it down to, unlike the attributable fraction, these are not going to add to more than 100%. So they're additive. That's a wonderful thing about them. They're additive. They have many other kind of statistical uh, proper, uh, uh, properties. It looks at all actual combinations uh, of the factors that you have in your data set. And so then you can look at these also as these temporal contributions. Next, please. So we're not specifying a causal pathway. Uh, uh, we're just looking at these individual additive associations and we're averaging across all possible conditions that actually occur in the data. Um, and uh, the looking at these coexisting risk factors for these diverse relationships. Next, please. So we're using NHATS. Uh, we're uh, linking this to the uh, Medicare uh, data. In this case, we're therefore we can only use the fee for service, which we heard from um, uh, yesterday that, that that's kind of one limitation. So is it fully generalizable only to those with fee for service? How we're defining the chronic conditions is through the chronic condition data warehouse. It uses algorithms. Uh, for uh, defining these different conditions. That's why we're only looking at those uh, 67 and older. So we have an adequate look back period to define the conditions. Next, please. So I'm going to just allow you to look at these methods uh, later on and uh, let's go to the next slide. So we're gonna go back to that uh, lovely uh, geriatric research algorithm and statistical programs. And you're gonna see, you can get the code to do this yourself right there. And so you wanna know any details, you can find them all out there and get the code in SAS yourself and uh, uh, all the instructions on how to use it. Next, please. Okay, some baseline characteristics of our uh, cohort. We can see um, there, you know, nearly 60% of each of the groups has two or more chronic conditions. Next, please. Uh, here's, so remember our three outcomes we're looking at are hospitalization, skilled nursing facility, and mortality. So these are just some, some summary of the follow-up. Next, please. So one of the neat things, and uh, we heard from Dr. Canones on uh, Monday, is that uh, the, the chronic condition pairs and, and more than pairs um, don't always coincide. So one of the things I would argue about is of why the races should be separately modeled is the co-occurring conditions don't uh, necessarily occur in the same um, uh, proportions across them uh, and neither in the same combinations. Next, please. Now, if we look at uh, baseline prevalence on the left and incidence on the right, we can take something like diabetes and see that um, our black respondents uh, had much higher diabetes uh, prevalence uh, and incidents after follow-up, while the uh, white participants uh, had higher uh, COPD at baseline, but not but a lower incidence over follow-up. So not only is the prevalence and incidence different uh, uh, for some of these conditions over the follow-up period. Next, please. But we see our adjusted risk ratios. Now, these are all just elements that are going into the leaf. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to try and convince you they're not all identical. Next, please. 
And so here's, here's a leaf. So these are the additive uh, elements. So these conditions are now additive that go into this. It's a very busy slide, so I'm gonna break it down into uh, a couple easier to digest slides. Next, please. So we are doing a, a bias corrected and accelerated bootstrapping to uh, get these confidence intervals. Um, the yellow represents, um, this is for hospitalizations, these are the conditions. Um, the yellow is simply on here to uh, represent which of the two groups were higher. So we can see for ischemic heart disease, very common in the cohort, but nearly twice the, the additive uh, effect, uh, the contributions to hospitalizations for non-Hispanic Blacks while uh, AFib is, is uh, not quite twice uh, that for uh, non-Hispanic whites for hospitalization as well as COPD. Next, please. Now the green represents when you're having a, uh, uh, a qualitative interaction uh, in the sense that uh, we did actually run these uh, with interactions as well, but you're seeing your effect estimates are going in opposite directions. For, so for skilled nursing facility admission, the contribution of AFib is very different. So it's almost, it's not significant, but it's almost protective for uh, the non-Hispanic Blacks. And then we can look at something like dementia where, um, you have nearly twice the contribution in a positive manner uh, for, for Blacks. So this is why I think sometimes we need to see if the effect estimates and the, the in this case, prevalence and incidences uh, differ greatly, you know, statistics isn't magic. So we can only ask so much of it. Next, please. And then this is for mortality. So I'm not gonna dwell on this very much, except to say uh, kidney disease contributes nearly 20% towards mortality for our non-Hispanic black participants. And that um, uh, we, we can see that there really are some differences again. Next, please. So the implication is, uh, this is a way to look at additive contributions, right? We're trying to look at methods. We're trying to look at interrelationships. Uh, we're trying to look at uh, what may be happening to, that results in some of these later life health disparities. Um, again, this is, there could be different causal pathways that are leading to this due to sociodemographic early and midlife exposures. And then we see cardiovascular conditions. We had talk earlier uh, uh, on cardiovascular conditions. Those were greater contributories for outcomes for the white respondents, while renal conditions were greater outcomes for black respondents. These are ways maybe we can help uh, target uh, areas that we can improve uh, care, access to care, follow-up care. Um, and so uh, next, please. So here's my conclusions. I just like to remind you all in November of 2020, the American Medical Association policies recognize race as a social, not biologic construct. Um, and in 1984, Rose and all uh, described that 85% of all possible human genetic variation occurs between two persons from the same ethnic group 8% between tribes or nations, and 7% between the so-called major races. Um, and the um, last point I want to uh, leave you with is this graphic. So from that video we saw, or you know, I struggled to show you, um, this, uh, that is a citation of the article. Um, it really is trying to help us move from a race-based medicine that has implications for research, medical education, and clinical practices to a race-conscious medicine. So we recognize there are underpinnings that may be leading to 
earlier ages of onset, differing um, ability to how a person is actually uh, treated. Maybe as, as we're hearing about UAB, they have an excellent cancer center, but maybe one individual's go back to their home setting, they don't have the same access of follow-up care. And so, you know, as we also heard that this is a, it may be very slow to um, move the ship, but there are, um, there are ideas about how we can do this together. And I, I hope this all does remind us that this, we're on one planet and we're all in this together. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. I've appreciated the opportunity you, you've given me to share this with you. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, have a couple of uh, final words, but before maybe uh, somebody have uh, questions. Uh, <coughs> questions, comments. Anatoly has, Anatoly has a comment. Yeah, I, I enjoy this presentation. And uh, yes, thank you very much. You ask a very interesting and exciting questions and produce a lot of useful insights. Let me add something to what you said. We have some strange situation uh, because we always need to translate uh, results from animal experimental studies to humans. And we trust results of animal studies because, because they establish connections uh, using uh, tools, instruments, which we never can use with humans. But keeping laboratory animals is very expensive business. So they make the experiments using 20 or maximum 50 uh, research subjects. But we trust the results and try to replicate these connections using uh, data available in our disposition, like Framingham data or CHS data with uh, several thousand people. And sometimes we observe that there is no replication at all. And we try to understand what something's going wrong. Probably we need more data. Let's collect data like in UK by a bank, 500,000 uh, individuals, and then we will get something interesting. But the focus of our research is uh, personalized medicine, right? We would like to, uh, do something useful for individual. And the more data we have, the more uh, average results we will get. So what kind of paradoxical situation we have? There? Well, the I think, you know, one of the challenges you, you bring up uh, is the, the lack of translation. So I, I, I do make jokes that, uh, you know, if you're a mouse, we can cure your cancer, or you've got, you know, your dementia, not a problem. Um, you know, if we even look at Parkinson's models, right? They, they don't actually occur. We, we do an acute insult model, yeah. right? And then from there, we assume that these drugs are gonna help people that have a totally different form of onset. Um, you know, we, we create these um, mutations and then we go on to cure the mutation that, that they had and everything else was perfect. And oddly enough, people don't work the same way. Then that was a point of, of uh, kind of the generation of uh, menagerie, that, that informatics tool, is to show really you only have a lot more confidence when you're using uh, more and more animal, animal species and you're finding consistent results that it is much more likely to have the ability to translate. And so that's why the number of species was actually very important. And the, an individual researcher can look at what the, their specific interest is and then see it, it not only should help you look at potentials, but also where are their knowledge gaps. And so, uh, so I would say, um, we put an awful lot of money into discovery. We even heard, heard about the, the uh, millions of, of dollars put into uh, drug discovery. 
And it is very hard, but that's, that is our motivation to make this completely public free resource for people trying to um, not to do both uh, gene discovery. And I completely agree with the epi epigenetic approaches. And I think that have also the challenges, you know, when are those occurring over the lifespan, right? So just like we tried to look at childhood traumas, well, there's midlife traumas and later life traumas, the trauma of losing your, your spouse, right? So there are gonna be traumas persons living with dementia experience when their caregiver may pass away. Right, I agree, absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.